Hi, in this video, I am going to go through the uh, Salter's A-level chemistry paper. Um, this is paper one, the um, paper one here. Uh, it's the 2020 paper, and I will do just the um, uh, the first half of the paper, and I'll, I'll finish it off in the next video. So it's chemistry, OCRB, Salter's paper one, 2020. Okay. Right, which statement about electromagnetic radiation is correct? So what I've done here is I've drawn a bit of, on the right-hand side, I have drawn a bit of the spectrum. So you can see we've got infrared with the lowest frequency, then you've got the visible going red, orange up to violet, and we've got the UV slightly higher frequency, right? As the frequency increases, the wavelength is gonna get shorter. That's why I remember that. So infrared at a shorter wavelength, that's wrong. It's got a longer wavelength than visible. The frequency of infrared is higher. No, it's smaller than visible. Infrared and ultraviolet travel at the same speed. That's true. All kinds of it, they all do. And D, visible light has a higher frequency than ultraviolet. It's got a lower frequency. So really the only one that, well, C is so obviously right that you could probably ignore the other ones if you were trying to go quickly. Okay. So here's a mass spectrum of a sample of an element. And the abundance of the different isotopes, we've got one at 10 and one at 11 here. What's the relative atomic mass of the element? Well, you would, to work out the relative atomic mass, you do the abundance multiplied by the isotope. So you're going to do uh, this one here is uh, 10, and that's 20% times 0 0.2 uh, plus the one here, which is 11, and that's 80%, so that times 0 0.8. That gives you 10.8. Now you could probably, so the answer is B. You could probably tell it was going to be that anyway without doing the calculation because you've only got 10 and 11 there, yeah? So it's got to be somewhere between 10 and 11. So you can forget about C and D, they're impossible. And because there's a lot more of the 11 than the, than the 10, it's not going to be 10.5. It's going to be closer to 11. It's going to be 10.8. So you could save yourself a bit of time by doing that, that, that like that. Okay. Evidence for the atomic nucleus. Well, the, what it was, it was um, firing alpha particles at gold leaf. And you remember, if surprisingly, some of the alpha particles You'd expect them all to go straight through, but occasionally you got they got one that actually bounced back because the nucleus is positively charged and the alpha particle is positively charged and it repelled it. So that is the answer there. The others are all sort of red herrings, really. Okay. Right. Reversible reactions reach dynamic equilibrium. Which of these correct? Right, yeah, well, let's have a think about this then. A plus B going to C. They must be set up in a closed system, yeah. Because remember, Le Chatelier's principle, so if it's not closed, for example, if you're making C, if C keeps escaping, it's a gas or something, well, uh, the position of the equilibrium is going to keep shifting to the right to make more C. It will never reach equilibrium. So A is correct. The overall concentrations remain because the molecules have stopped reacting. No, it hasn't stopped reacting. It's just the rate of the forward is equal to the rate of the backward reaction. So it's going forwards and backwards all the time. That's what it means, dynamic. Uh, the C is obviously wrong. And D, the position of equilibrium is always independent temperature. It's not, um, of course, if the same of this was uh, an exothermic reaction and you increase the temperature, Le Chatelier tells us, the position of equilibrium would move so as to oppose the change so you go forwards so a is the answer there okay what is the functional group in this molecule here so i've drawn it out benzene ring and you can see and a ketone you can see it is a ketone um that is the only one there Right, this is a tricky question. Which row shows the correct pollutants produced when burning the fuel? Okay. Um, biodiesel, you you would get you would get oxides of nitrogen 
So that is definitely wrong. And you probably also get a bit of sulfur dioxide as well, because there's always a bit of sulfur in um, organic material. Okay. Uh, ethanol, um, you won't get sulfur dioxide. Um, so that's wrong. Petrol, you definitely get carbon monoxide. So that's wrong. So it looks like this is the hydrogen one is, is the only possible one. You, you think where are the oxides of nitrogen are going to come from when you burn hydrogen? Well, you've got nitrogen in the air. So it's the nitrogen reacting with oxygen from the air that you're using to burn the hydrogen. So that's the correct answer there is C. What causes an enhanced greenhouse effect? Well, it's the absorption of um, infrared rays, isn't it? It's nothing to do with ozone, which is all to do with um, filtering out UV light. So all these things to do with UV and ozone, they're all wrong. And C is correct. The greenhouse gas that we mostly think of is CO2, but of course, methane is also a potent greenhouse gas. It absorbs infrared. Okay, which iron would have a colored chloride? Now, for it to have a colored chloride, you must have a uh, partly filled D shell. Right, so you can see, if you look at the position of copper here, right, copper right, has got um, right, electronic structure of copper unexpectedly really is uh, is 3D10, 4S1. You'd expect it to be 3D9, 4S2, really, but it's not. Okay, so when copper loses, uh, it forms a Ce1 plus ion, it loses that electron. It's got a full D shell, so it's not colored. Uh, scandium here, let's look at scandium. Well, scandium is not a proper transition metal, you remember, because it's scandium is 3D1, 4S2, and it only ever forms a three plus ion, so it's got no electrons in the D shell, so that won't be not partly filled. Zinc is not a proper transition metal because zinc is 3D10, 4S2, so when it forms the two plus ion, you have got um, a full D shell, so it's got to be titanium. Let's just check Ti3 plus. Titanium is... It's here in the periodic table, so you've got it's 4s, sorry, 3d2, 4s2. So when it forms a Ti3 plus ion, you're going to lose the s electrons and you're going to lose one of the d electrons. You've still got one left, you've got a partly filled d shell, it is colored. Right, that gas liquid chromatography now, okay. So glass liquid chromatography, you have the column here. Now you put the sample in and it will move down the column. Okay. Um, different things will stay in the column, will have a longer retention time, it will stay in the column. Okay. Now to make the sample move, you've got to add a carrier gas. You've got to push nitrogen or argon to make it move along, otherwise it's not going to move. Right. So the column consists of a low boiling point liquid on a porous support. No, it's just... It's just a, uh, it's a solid. The compound with the longest retention time comes first. No, that will come out last. It will stay in the column. The emerging compounds can be detected by mass spec. Yeah, you can do that. That's true. Uh, the sample does not need a carrier gas. You do to push the sample along. As I said, you need nitrogen or argon. Okay, fusion reaction then. Okay. Which equation could represent a fusion reaction in the sun? Now, they, they've given us the, the mass number here. They haven't given us a proton number. So if I, hydrogen is that. So that means that this thing here, was not that wouldn't be hydrogen. That would actually be, um, it would be helium because it would have two protons. So that's not right. Uh, likewise here, this wouldn't be hydrogen. This is, you know, you've got two protons in there. So that would be helium. because Yeah, so that's not right. Uh, once again, here you would get, you will, you'd end up with two protons in this side of the equation, but on the right hand side, we've got two for the helium and one for the hydrogen, three. So it's not balanced, so it can't be that. So it must be this one. Let's just check that. So we've got two protons for the helium, two protons for the helium, four protons uh, 
uh, all together. And we've got uh, two protons in the helium and then two in each hydrogen. So we have got four protons. So that's all balanced. Okay. And the number of mass balances as well. All right, the lowest boiling point of these compounds. Right, now, if you look at B and C, these are both got OH groups, so they're going to have H bonds, H bonding, so they're going to have a higher, strongest intermolecular force. A and D, you're only going to get dipole-dipole interactions or maybe um, uh, London forces as well. Right, now, which is going to have the strongest London forces out of that molecule and that one? They've both got the same their isomers of each other, but this is a straight chain. So those molecules are going to pack together more efficiently. You've got more points of contact, as these ones are going to be more like that shape. So you've got all these points of contact here. It's a straight chain, so you've got stronger London forces. And that one. So that means this one is going to have a slightly lower boiling point. So D is the answer. Right, which reaction involves the heterolytic fission of a halogen molecule? Okay, so what does that mean? So heterolytic means, well, homolytic is when you've got two electrons there and each chlorine goes away with one electron. So you form two chlorine free radicals. Heterolytic fission means that uh, <coughs> Both of the electrons go to one of the chlorines, so you end up with a Cl minus there. Okay, chloride ion. Right, <coughs> A, the formation of chlorine radicals and chlorine molecules, that's what's happening there. That is homolytic fission, that's, that's not right. The electrophilic substitution of chlorine with alkenes, that is the answer. Let's just see how that works. So there is an alkene. A chlorine molecule comes along. You get an induced dipole there. That becomes delta positive because you've got all the negative charge in the in the pi bond there. The pi bond goes onto that chlorine there, and the both electrons in that bond go onto the chlorine. So that that second red arrow drawn is heterolytic cleavage of a chlorine molecule, which is an alkene. So that is correct. Okay. The substitution of halogens with alkanes, now that's free radical substitution again, so that is what's happening there. And the reaction of hydrogen bromide with, with alkenes, well, that's not a HBr, it's not a halogen molecule, uh, it's a hydrogen halide, so that's not the answer. So B is the answer there. Okay, what happens when this compound is distilled with acidified? Now, it means distilled and distilled off. It doesn't say reflux. And of course, when we get a, what kind of an alcohol is this? Well, this is a primary alcohol because that red carbon I've drawn is only attached to one other carbon. That one there, or that green one. It's a primary alcohol. So, primary alcohol, you remember, you can first of all, you oxidize it to an aldehyde. If you distill it and if you reflux, then you're going to get a carboxylic acid. Right, but it says here we're distilling it, so we're going to form the aldehyde. We're not going to get carboxylic acid. D's wrong. It will react, and tertiary alcohols won't react with, with can't oxidize them. And this one, a ketone, will you get that it was a secondary alcohol? And it's not a secondary, it's a primary. Right, this is about sacrificial metals. Okay, so you've got an iron nail going rusty in water. Well, we've got zinc on this left hand one, which so is more reactive. So that will protect the nail from rusting. So let's, so X will rust more slowly. X will rust, rust at the same rate of Y. No, it won't. Y will rust faster than X. That is true. X will rust faster. No. Y will rust faster if copper replaces the zinc around X. Um, no, if that would be the way around. If you put copper, which is less reactive, on, then, then the nail, if you wrap it in copper, it will react, it will go rusty more quickly. But B is the answer there.
Which statement about an enzyme reaction is correct? They only work over a narrow range of pHs. That is definitely true, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to do that one there. Yeah, that is the right answer. They only work over 10 degrees. No, they, they work. They work best at 37, of course, but they'll work at any temperature below that as well. It'll be all right, so more than 10 degrees. The reaction is always zero with respect to the enzyme. That's not right because the enzyme speeds it up. So if you had a bit more enzyme, it's going to go faster probably. And the reaction is always zero with respect to the substrate. That's not true um, either. Um, okay, so A is definitely the right answer there, yeah. Okay, manganate reacting with iron. Okay, so what volume of Fe2 plus will react with that? Well, let's work out the moles of manganate first. Moles of manganate is equal to concentration times volume. Concentration is 0 0.05, volume 25 over 1,000 dm cubed. That gives us the moles of manganate there to be Um, 1.25 times 10 to the minus 3. So how many moles of iron will that react with? Well, we're going to multiply that by 5 because of the ratio there. So the moles Fe3 plus equal to that multiplied by 5. That's equal to 6.25 times 10 to the minus 3. Now we need to do what volume of iron of solutions we need. So the volume is equal to the moles over the conch. The moles we've got 6.25 times 10 to the minus three, and the concentration is 0.1. That's equal to 0 0.0625 dm cubed, multiply it by a thousand. That gives you 62.5 centimeters cubed. Okay. All right, the pH of a 0 0.05 mole per decimeter solution of NaOH, what we need to use here, Kw is equal to H plus conch times OH minus concentration. Okay, so our H plus concentration is equal to Kw over OH minus. Kw from the data sheet is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. And our concentration of NaOH is 0 0.05. Now, all of that dissolves, so the OH minus concentration is also 0 0.05. That gives us 2 times 10 to the minus 12 mole per decimeter cubed. Take the minus log of that. Give us the pH. Minus log is 11.7 is our answer there. Okay, here's a question about proteins. Right, so, right, insulin is a protein consisting of two chains. I've drawn my little diagram of insulin over there. Uh, right, so part of the chain is a helical. Uh, okay, and so what have we got here? Well, the, um, these are the alpha helix, which, which is are held together by H bonds. The alpha helix. Okay. Um, that is called the secondary structure. We call that the secondary structure, that the, the alpha helix. And the tertiary structure is uh, what, when you have how the alpha helixes are arranged in respect to each other and held in place by these red dulse disulfide bridges here. Okay. So the bond, the covalent bonds holding the chains together are, are disulfide bridges is correct, okay? B, let's just see, the overall folding of the helical parts and the other molecules called the secondary structure, that's not, the, 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 that's, that's the tertiary structure. Um, just the helix itself is the secondary structure, not the arrangement of the helixes, okay? The helical parts are held together by peptide links. No, they're held together by hydrogen bonds. And the helical parts of the primary structure, you know, the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids in the protein. 
Okay, now a solution of lead nitrate is added to sodium sulfate and potassium iodide. What's observed? Right, so um, now lead iodide, PBI2, is insoluble and it's yellow. So that is going to give us a yellow precipitate. Now, the only one which gives us a yellow precipitate is C. So that has got to be the right answer. And it so happens there that looks so lead sulfate, which is 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 pretty insoluble. It's not totally insoluble. Uh, yeah, that's going to give you a white precipitate. It depends on the concentration, I think. If you had very dilute um, sodium sulfate and lead nitrate, then you wouldn't necessarily get a white precipitate. But that is the only one that kind of fits. So it's the only one that makes the yellow precipitate of lead iodide. Right. So. Electromagnetic radiation of that frequency breaks a bond. What's the bond enthalpy? So we need to use this equation. E, the energy, is equal to Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency of the radiation. That will give us the energy of one bond. Let's do that. Planck's constant from the data sheet is... Is it 6.26, is it? One minute. 6.62 times 10 to the minus 32. Minus 34 joule second, that is. So it's in joules. And the frequency we're given there is 8.34 times 10 to the 14. And that's in hertz, which is per second. So our answer is going to be in joules there. So we get 5.2, 5.52 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now, what have we got to do? We've got to convert it up to bond enthalpy in kilojoules per mole. So we have to, that's per bond. So per, for, uh, per mole, we've got to multiply by the Avogadro constant, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Let's do that. We multiply the Avogadro constant, get it per mole. We get 332,414 joules per mole. Divide by a thousand to get it in kilojoules. Let's get rid of that kilojoules. So it's going to be about 333. That is the answer there. Okay, so there's an Arrhenius equation here. All right, so they give us the Arrhenius equation. And I've written it down in red here. Ln k is equal to minus Ea over R multiplied by one over t. So I've just taken that t out there to make it a bit more, a bit easier. Um, and plus run a. So now we make that fit into the, 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 light, the equation of a straight line there. So if we plot ln k on the y-axis, which is what they've done there, we are going to get, and we plot uh, that against one over the absolute temperature. That's going to be x. That means our gradient is going to be minus ea over r gradient and the intercept on the y-axis is ln a and so you're going to end up with a line activation energy is always positive so you're going to get a negative gradient like that okay but the intercept on the y-axis on the x-axis is ln a that's wrong it's not the intercept on the x-axis is the next one it's the intercept on the y-axis that's ln a there isn't it Uh, let's check the others. The slope is minus EA. No, it's not. It's minus, it's my it, slope is EA. It's not, it's minus EA over R. Is that there? And the slope is not EA over R, it's minus EA over R. So that's wrong. So the answer is B. Twenty-two. Okay. Which esterification reaction is correct? Now, <clears throat> let's look at the first one. We've got this, which is the acid anhydride, which I've drawn in green over here, ethanoic anhydride, reacting with ethanol. And what's going to happen is you're going to lose, you're going to lose that. That's going to give you ethanoic acid, and you're going to form the ester linkage there. 
And that's what we've got there. We've got the correct ester and we've got ethanoic acid as the other molecule. That is the right answer. Okay, uh, let's just look at the other ones. Right, so if I've got, right, let's look at B, it's methanol, isn't it, this time? So I just change that. Right, so what's going to happen there is you're going to form the ester there. You're going to get ethanoic acid for me. Right, uh, they haven't got that, have they? They've got two molecules of the ester. You don't get that. You get one molecule of ester and one of ethanoic acid. C, you have got ethanoic acid reacting with phenol. Right. Um, now, this one looks all right, but ethanoic acid will not react with phenols because phenol is not reactive enough okay it's less reactive than a normal alcohol uh with the phenol where the oh is on a benzene ring so that you wouldn't get any reaction occurring with that uh, uh the last one is not correct because they've got these two the wrong way around okay look that the the the, the product there would be ch3 c o coming from this yeah and then do that in a different color. The ethanol, that would be that bit there. Well, they've got, they've got the, you know, have got the, the two halves of the molecule, the one way around there, that's wrong. Okay. You would get HCl though. Okay. So A is the correct answer there. Okay. Which formula has the correct systematic name? Right. This is not propyl chloride. It's propanoyl chloride, isn't it? An acid and high acid chloride, sorry, propanoyl chloride would be the right answer there, the right name. This is ethylene glycol. This is not a systematic name, that's what it's called, but it's really ethane 1 2 diol. Uh, this one here is not quite right because it's right, you don't need to call it propan 1 al because an aldehyde can only go on the end, so it's just propanol. That's wrong. Uh, and this one, propanoic anhydride, it is an acid anhydride, and there's three, you've got three carbons in it, so it's prop, yeah, that is the correct one. Right, carbon monoxide and N2 both have a, an MR values of, of 28. How can they, why can they be distinguished from high resolution mass spec? Right, and it's because they're not exactly, it's only a prox 28, isn't it? Because, yes, carbon does weigh exactly 12. Uh, nitrogen weighs, doesn't weigh exactly, does not exactly 14. It's, it's a tiny bit more. And oxygen is not exactly 16. It's a tiny bit less, I think. So, they have the, the, so the exact MR of these are not exactly 28. And high resolution can distinguish that. And that's it. So the answer here is the values of the M plus peaks would be different. Okay, uh, now A is correct, it's true, but that's not why you can distinguish it with mass spec. They do, it does have a dipole. And carbon monoxide is more reactive than that, but that's not why you can distinguish it. Um, they would give different fragments actually, but in high resolution, what you're looking for is the different MZ value. Okay, so uh, C is the correct answer. 25. Right. Magnesium has a higher charge density than calcium, which is that, that's because it's magnesium two plus ion. Of course, it's got less electron shells. It's only got two quantum shells filled. Calcium has got three. Two plus, right. Um, so Mg, magnesium carbonate is, thermal, is more thermally stable. It's less thermally stable because, right, because that is a higher charge and it's more polarizing and it polarizes the carbonate ion. So that's not right. It's less stable. If you remember the stability of the carbonates increases as you go down group two. That's because the ions become less polarizing because they've got lower charge density. So they've all got plus two charge, but they, they're getting bigger. Um, Magnesium has a less exothermic enthalpy change of hydration. No, it would be more exothermic because magnesium is better at attracting water molecules to it. 
the delta negative end of the water molecule. Why is it better? Because it's got a higher charge density. That's wrong. The ionic radius of magnesium is greater. It's not. It's smaller. So it's got to be that one. And the lattice enthalpy of magnesium chloride is more. It is more um, exothermic again because the magnesium ion is better at attracting the chloride ions in the lattice because it's got a higher charge density. Right, structural isomers of with a formula C5H10. Okay, now unsaturated. So that means we are ignoring cyclic things. Yeah, you can have like, you know, cyclopentane. That will be C5H10. But we're not worrying about that because it hasn't got a double bond, only unsaturated things, okay? Okay, so let's first of all think, if we have the red over and the red here, we've got uh, five carbon atoms in a straight line. Well, you can see you've got two isomers there because the, the, the double bond can go between one and two or two and three. Let's say if you have um, uh, the, the methyl butane structure in green there, right? So you can have the double bond there, that's one. It's the same there, so that's not another one. Or it could be there, or it could be there. So you've got three possibilities there. Let's say now you've got two branches in it. Uh, this one here. Now you can't have that because you must have a double bond in it. And of course, none of those carbons could form a double bond to the middle one because the bond we would end up with more than four bonds. So we've got two plus three is five is the answer. Right. Um, right. Okay. So hydrochloric acid reacting with calcium carbonate. Well, we need to see which one of these is in excess, right? Okay, so let's work out the moles of HCl. Well, that's times volume. We've got a concentration of 0.75 multiplied by the volume, which is 100. So 0 0.75 times 0 0.1. That's equal to 0 0.075 moles. Now let's work out the, um, the calcium carbonate moles. Mass over MR. The mass they tell us is 2.5 and the MR is 100, so that's 0 0.025 moles. Right. Now look at the ratio. We need two moles of HCl to react with every one of calcium carbonate. And so we only need 0 0.05 moles of the HCl. So not all the HCl is going to react. Okay, so that is in excess. Some of the HCl won't react. So how many moles of calcium carbonate are going to react is 0 0.025 moles. So that means how many moles of carbon dioxide are we going to make? Well, one calcium carbonate gives us one CO2. So the moles of carbon dioxide is 0 0.025. And what's the volume at RTP? So it's moles, 0 0.025, multiplied by the molar volume, which is 24,000. And that gives us uh, 600, I think. Yeah, 600 centimeters cubed. So our answer is 600 there. Right, a manufacturer is producing a medicine. Consider the following is improving the process. Okay, which one result in the green process? Right, raising the temperatures to get it more quickly. That's going to be less green because you're going to make more greenhouse gases, more carbon dioxide by having high temperature. Uh, use a catalyst to get the product more quickly, yeah, that will make it greener. And reducing the number of steps, yeah, that will make it will be less waste process, less waste. Okay, so two and three. So C is our answer there. Twenty nine, which compounds can be made from benzene in one step? Right. Uh, this can be what you need to do is you need to react benzene with uh, chlorine and a halogen carrier such as aluminium chloride. That will give you chloro-benzene. Uh, this one you can make in one step, yeah, because you, you get um, nitrating mix, you get um,
conch nitric and conch sulfuric acid to generate the NO2 plus ion. And you'll get nitrobenzene. But this one you can't do in one step because you can't stick an NH2 straight onto a benzene ring. You need to make nitrobenzene first of all, and then reduce it with tin and HCl to form phenylamine. Okay, so that one is, requires two steps. So it's one and two. So B is the correct answer. Okay. Benzene can be shown as V or W, okay? So we know that V is probably more accurate representation. Which of the following statements are evidence for structure V rather than W? Right, the carbon-carbon bonds are all the same in benzene. That is true because if it was double bonds are shorter than singles, so um, uh, that would give you, um, uh, uh, or they'd have different bond lengths. Okay, now two I'm gonna leave out for a minute. Three, the enthalpy of hydrogenation of benzene is three times the cyclohexane. Hexene, it's not, it's less than that, isn't it? Because it, so it clearly doesn't have three double bonds. Um, right, number two, I would be tempted to say that two was correct because if you've got different bond angles, then you're not going to have regular, um, you're not going to have, they're not, um, the, the, the internal bond angles of the hexagon aren't going to be, are going to be different, okay? Um, so I would say two is correct, but if you look in the mark scheme one, and that is, the answer is not B, the one the answer they want is D. Okay, so I would have got that one wrong. Okay, but I don't know. I maybe think that 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 isn't the right answer, but that's the answer in the mark scheme. Right. Um, right. On to, that's the end of the multiple choice section. So I'll just do the first question in the non-multiple choice. Okay. So. This is about diesel engines, this question. Okay, so uh, you've got set A and C60 and H34, right? Now, uh, equation for the combustion of it, so that's pretty straightforward. So we've got uh, C16, H34, plus oxygen. It's going to give us CO2 and water, and it's complete combustion. That means we've got to have 16 carbon dioxide molecules, and we've got to have half of 34, that's 17 water molecules. So that means we have got um, uh, 32 plus 17, 49 molecules of oxygen, 49 atoms of oxygen there, right hand side. So that means we need 24 and a half O2 molecules. Okay, diesel vehicles are fitted with two-way catalytic converters containing platinum and palladium, blah, 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 blah. These catalyze the oxidation of hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide to CO2 and water. What kind of catalyst, catalysis is it? Right, it is heterogeneous catalyst. It's a heterogeneous catalyst. Why? Because the catalyst is a solid, they're in different phases, and the reactants and products are all gases. So they're in different phases. Okay, that's all you need there, I think. Right. One mark, how does how does the catalyst speed up the reaction? It's only one mark, so you don't have to talk about adsorption or anything. You just need to see alternative route with a lower activation energy, sort of GCSE answer, really. Lower activation energy. Okay, there is high air concentration in the air fuel. This makes the formation of oxides of nitrogen more likely. The catalyst is not effective at removing nit oxides of nitrogen. One oxide of nitrogen is NO, and that oxidizes in air to NO2. Say the appearance of NO. Well, NO is colorless. And describe what is seen as it comes out of the exhaust pipe of a car. Well, I'd be tempted to say you can't see anything because it's so dilute, but... NO2, because it oxidizes when it comes out, NO2 is brown. Uh, and so you see a brown gas coming out, but you, you can't see a brown gas, can you? Because well, that's the answer they want, because it's too dilute. Right, write an equation for the formation of NO in the engine. Well, it's just the reaction between nitrogen and oxygen. So we're going to have uh, a half N2 and a half O2. 
goes to NO. Okay, so urea is used in car exhaust systems. This is this add blue stuff you put in the car uh, to remove oxides of nitrogen. The urea reacts in the exhaust system as shown. Okay, the forward reaction is only feasible at certain temperatures. Use the entropy values to calculate the temperature. Okay, three marks. So what we're going to do here, we have got to work out. Um, we've got to work out. Basically, we know that delta S total is equal to delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings. And it only becomes feasible when delta S total is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Right, so first of all, we need to work out delta S of the system. Okay, let's do that. Right. So we've got H2O and ammonia, ammonia, urea. And that goes to um, two ammonias and a carbon dioxide. So let's work out the, the entropy of the products. Okay, so what have we got here? We have got... Right, we've got two moles of ammonia, so that's going to be uh, two times uh, ammonia is 192.3. And we've got one carbon dioxide, so that's 213.6. Add all that up together, what do we get? We get 598.2. So that's the entropy of the products. Let's work out the entropy of the reactants. Okay, so water we've got is 69.9, and urea is 173.9. It's one molecule of each, one mole of each of those. So add those together, we get 243.8. So delta S of the system then, we subtract the red number from the green, the reactants from the products. So delta S system. is going to be equal to 598.2 minus that's the products minus the react the entropy of the reactants 243.8 uh, that gives us um, 354.4 And the units of that importantly are joules per mole per Kelvin, not kilojoules, okay? Now we have to work out delta S surrounding, okay? Now, do you remember the equation for delta S surrounding? Delta S surrounding, that is equal to delta H minus delta H over T, okay? Now we can't work that out because we don't know what T is, so we're going to put that into this equation. I'll write it out again. So we've got delta S total. You've got delta S system plus delta S surrounding, which I'll substitute. I'll call that, that delta minus delta H over T. I'll put that in the equation there. Delta H over T, the absolute temperature, okay? Now we're gonna say, we wanna find out what is the value of T when Delta S total is equal to zero. And that will give us the minimum temperature at which the reaction is gonna happen, okay? For, of course, for a reaction to happen, Delta S of the total must be equal to zero or greater than zero, otherwise the reaction is not feasible. Okay. So, let's put the numbers in then. Okay, so we know zero, which is delta S total. The delta S system, we worked that out, that's 354.4.
Delta H, they tell us in the question is, write it here, Delta H is equal to um, plus 113 kilojoules per mole. We need to convert that into joules because our S, our S value there, that's in joules. So that's 113,000. So that's going to be 113,000 over T, the absolute temperature. So let's just do that. So we get 113,000 over T is equal to 354.4. Rearrange that, we get T is equal to 113,000 over 354.4, and that works out to be 318 Kelvin. Okay, the temperature is in Kelvin there. Okay, so not a massively high temperature, but not room temperature, higher than room temperature. Okay, that is uh, quite a lot of work there. Right. Uh, Equation 31.1 is repeated again below, okay? Uh, the ammonia produced in equation, in the equation, reacts with oxygen and NO in the presence of the catalyst, water and nitrogen form, so that's how it's getting rid of the NO. Construct an equation called this reaction, okay, so we want, um, we want ammonia uh, plus NO plus O2 that's going to give us N2 and H2O. Well, I'm going to say, right, I'm going to put a, leave the oxygens here the same, but three oxygens on the left. That means I'm going to have to have three waters. That means I'm going to have to have six hydrogens, so I need two ammonia molecules. And that means the nitrogens, I'm going to get one and a half nitrogens there. It's been stated that cars cause the most pollution on short journeys. Evaluate the state in terms of the rate and equilibrium position of the reaction shown. Okay, now, let's think about equilibrium first, okay? Uh, this is an endothermic reaction. So at low temperatures, the equilibrium uh, position will be to the left. So in other words, uh, this is only good at making ammonia at higher temperatures, okay? So uh, less NH3 made at low temperatures, i.e. on short journeys when the engine is cold, So it's not ideal for short journeys, okay? You've got less NH3. That can't, you, uh, you can't get rid of the NO. It's gonna get more pollution, okay? Uh, now we need to talk about the rate. Well, of course, the rate of any reaction is lower if the temperature is lower. So not only will the equilibrium position be unfavorable, but it, will, it won't be able to reach equilibrium because the rate will be too slow. So when the engine is cold, you're gonna get a slow rate of reaction there. Okay, F. The urea used in the exhaust system is manufactured from ammonia and carbon dioxide. And okay, so the production of ammonia is given by equation there, nitrogen and hydrogen go into ammonia. Right, so we've got to work out the equilibrium constant for this. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is gonna write down the equation again. So we've got N2 plus 3H2. It's gonna to go to um, two NH3. I'm going to put down here start moles. Put 
put the used duct moles. And final moles. In equilibrium moles. Okay. So the start moles, it says we start off with five of nitrogen. 12 of hydrogen, and we haven't got any ammonia to start off with. When analyzing equilibrium, we've got six moles of ammonia made, okay? So final moles, we've got six moles of ammonia. Right, to make six moles of ammonia, we must have used up three moles of nitrogen. There's one mole of nitrogen gives you two of ammonia. And if you've used up three of nitrogen, we must use three times that amount of hydrogen, so three times three, nine of hydrogen. So how much nitrogen we've got left over there? We've got two moles. How much hydrogen? We have got three moles. So that's the final, final moles, but we need to know the final concentration to put it into the equilibrium constant. And the volume is one dm cubed. So the final concentration of the equilibrium concentration is moles of a volume, so two over one, three over one conveniently, and six over one. So don't need to do any working out there. Now we need to write down the expression for Kc. Kc here is going to be equal to the pen works. Hmm, not going to look for the pen. Okay, so we've got Kc is equal to um, the concentration of NH3 squared divided by the concentration of N2. multiplied by the concentration of H2 to the power of three. That is equal to, right, so we're gonna have uh, six squared over two multiplied by three cubed. That gives us 0.667. Now, what are the units of that? Right, let's give our units. So what have we got on the, on the top line? We've got right, two lots of mole per decimeter cubed. And on the bottom, we've got right, four. Okay, so the units are going to be mole um, to the minus two dm to the plus six. Right, that's about halfway through the paper. So I'm gonna leave it there and I will continue with that in the next video.